day terror was unleashed in London. There was a, a report of a bang at about 10 to 9. 56 people died and hundreds were injured in Britain's worst atrocity since the Lockerbie bombing. But do we know what really happened that day? We know that these people act in the name of Islam. The authorities swiftly blamed four British Muslims. But since then, a whole series of questions have been raised about 7-7. The official story, uh, if you uh, look at it under a close magnifying glass, doesn't appear to make sense. Why did the government say the bombers travelled to London on a train that never ran? What was this van from a controlled demolition firm doing next to the blown-up bus? This inflammatory internet video says 7-7 was an inside job. The four Muslims, actors or patsies. Were these men really suicide bombers? Or were they framed? The government story is actually a pack of lies. These um, four lads accused could not have done it. To many survivors, these are outrageous allegations. Going around saying people who are murderers are innocent is a lie. But there is suspicion. Some research suggests around one in four British Muslims think the government or MI5 were involved in 7-7. Who do not accept the government version of 7th of July. Programmes like this may be very controversial, but hopefully there will be people in the police service and in the security service and in government who will realise how important uh, conspiracy theories are. Tonight, we're going to test the conspiracy theories about 7-7 to separate fact from fiction. Thursday, 7th of July, 2005, began unlike any other working day. London was basking in glory. At the Games of the 30th Olympiad in 2012, are awarded to the city of London. But the euphoria was to be short-lived. A deadly plot was entering its final stages. According to the official account of 7-7, Three British Muslims left Leeds in the early hours, intent on mass murder. Just before 5 a.m., they stopped for petrol. One quibbled with the cashier over his change. At Luton Station, they met the fourth member of the cell. Carrying rucksacks filled with explosives, the four men caught a train. London's commuters could not know what was coming their way. Among them was Rachel North. Just before 8.30, the four men were caught on CCTV in King's Cross, heading towards the underground. At Finsbury Park Station, Rachel waited for a westbound Piccadilly Line train. After letting several go by, she got in the first carriage. More and more people were stuffing themselves on as we went down the line. We got to King's Cross and more people jammed themselves on. There were about eight deep on the platform. And I can remember the doors closing and people who hadn't managed to get on going through the windows at us. been traveling I think about 60 seconds and everything went black and there was this enormous force threw me to the floor and, and we couldn't breathe um, and it was so dark couldn't hear properly and, um, and then the screaming started at 8.50, the world changed. 
Within seconds, bombs tore through three tube trains across London. Around an hour later, the fourth man detonated his bomb on a bus. According to the official account, there's no doubt these four men murdered 52 people and injured 784 others in Britain's first suicide attacks. Now, some breaking news. Reports are just coming in of an explosion at Liverpool Street Station here in London. They believe at the moment uh, that it's a power surge. Still no indication that this was sabotage. Four huge explosions brought London to a standstill. The search began to make sense of what had happened. Since then, a growing network of skeptics have scrutinized every word and every picture for signs of a hidden truth. Four years on, conspiracy theories have mushroomed and a host of internet films have flourished, claiming that the government account of 7-7 is a deception. We are being deceived. What we're being offered is at best you probably think you know what happened that morning. You don't. The former MI5 spy David Shaler presents one video. The anomalies and the explosives you. Other filmmakers prefer to remain anonymous. These internet videos have found an audience. Tens of thousands of people have seen them online. But there is one video at the extreme end of the spectrum. 7-7 Ripple Effect was released two years after the attacks. Its unknown maker goes under an Arabic sounding name. A message from Moody about the 7th of July 2005 and see what we would While other conspiracy films just pose questions, 7-7 Ripple Effect goes further. Pre-planted explosives. The film says there's evidence the four men blamed for the bombings were framed. The one thing that we can be sure of is that it was not done by four young Muslims. The film claims these men were fall guys in a government plot to win support for the war on terror. For many 7-7 survivors and victims' families, the conspiracy theories are pernicious. Rachel North is appalled by them. I get bothered about the truth. To live through that and to, to still be alive in the aftermath and other people weren't. And to have seen firsthand the suffering it causes, it is genuinely upsetting to be told that my eyewitness account, other people's eyewitness accounts, other people's grief are wrong. Rachel is now seeking an independent public inquiry into 7-7. She wants to know whether the bombers could have been stopped. But she's also taking on the conspiracy theories because she fears they play into the hands of extremists. You know, all this is really inflammable stuff. We have a small minority of people spreading a big, powerful idea. And the big, powerful idea is there is a war on Islam, there is a war on Muslims, it is your duty to fight against those who strike at our people. The idea that the government's actually faked the 7-7 bombings in order to demonize Muslims is just throwing petrol onto the flames of this idea. The conspiracy theory has been picked up. An opinion poll two years after 7-7 found that around a quarter of British Muslims questioned thought the government or MI5 were involved in the 7-7 bombings. This is the central mosque in Birmingham. We were invited to film at Friday prayers. On the agenda, 7-7. How many people in this mosque, please raise hand, who do not accept the government version of 7th of July. The mosque chairman, Dr. Mohammed Nassim, is a leading figure in the community. I was doubtful from the very beginning of the story that as the story emerged, I thought it was too fast, too quick, there was, unless somebody else has already prepared it. He questions how the men blamed for the attacks were identified. A few days after 7-7, the police said they'd found vital evidence in the wreckage. 
We have since found personal documents bearing the names of three of those four men close to the seats of three of the explosions. But if the men blew themselves up, how did these documents survive? When the body blows up, now everything is destroyed. The body is turned into pieces. How come these whole documents will remain intact? Now, this is something that I cannot understand. For Dr. Nassim, it's too similar to a suspicious find after the 9-11 attacks in the wreckage of the Twin Towers. If you go back to 9-11, the aeroplane and that blew up everything, the metal melted, but the passport was found intact. Although the hijacker perished, along with everybody else on board, his passport survived. A few days after 7-7, a driver's license in the name of the bomber was found in the wreckage of the bus. The one who boarded the bus, the bus blew up, but his all identification papers were lying safe. Now it seems to me, his one organization is writing all these stories because they're very similar. There is an explanation for the mystery. According to court testimony, forensics suggest it's likely the driver's license wasn't on the bomber's body when the bomb went off. Like other documents recovered from the wreckage naming the bombers, the license was relatively undamaged. The pattern suggests the bombers dropped them nearby to ensure they would be identified. There are others who doubt the official account. Bristol, one Saturday in July last year. Around 60 people have come to a meeting arranged by the local branch of Britain's self-styled truth movement. What we really need is an army of citizen bloodhounds that will not just accept the initial story. And I think that's For many here, Suspicion 7-7 could have been an inside job, has been fueled by doubts about the 9-11 attacks. We have condemned four guys who admittedly are presumably dead um, without evidence being tested in a court of law. And that is a, a breach of the principle of innocent until proven guilty, and it's outrageous. And I think it's very important that we question whether what is supposed to have happened really did happen because it's been used as an excuse to erode the civil liberties of everybody. Do you think it's possible that the four men didn't do it? I think it's possible, yes. From an underground office nearby, Tony Gosling runs an internet forum popular with 7-7 skeptics. A journalist who once worked for the BBC, Tony has been looking into the attacks for four years. You have to go into these things with an open mind. I think it's really important that all journalists investigating these things do question the official story that's immediately rolled out. Tony's research is raising the unthinkable. It's possible that 7-7 is being used in order to persuade the British people to get behind the war on terror. And it's also, I think, entirely possible that these four guys are totally innocent. A number of people now question whether these four men really carried out the attacks on 7-7. But is there any real evidence to back up their belief? Six hours after the attacks on 7-7, the Metropolitan Police gave a news conference here in London. Brian Paddock, then a senior Metropolitan Police officer, ran it. Still, none of the bombers had been formally identified. The auditorium was filled with journalists, and they all had uh, many questions, uh, most of which we didn't know the answers to. Um, Above all, the first thing who was responsible? That, as far as I'm concerned, uh, Islamic and terrorism are, are two words that do not go together. However, we are treating this as a terrorist incident. We are keeping an open mind as to who the perpetrators might be. I was always very mindful of the fact uh, that we didn't know for sure 
and I didn't think it would help in terms of community relations, for example, to speculate about so-called misnamed Islamic terrorism. Eight hours after the bombs went off, the Prime Minister addressed the nation. This has been a most terrible and tragic atrocity. We know that these people act in the name of Islam. On the basis of the evidence that I was given, Tony Blair's statement went beyond the facts. At a stage where you've got the police saying, we're not sure who's done it, and a politician saying, we think that these people are acting in the name of Islam, uh, it's not going to, to, to go down very well with the Muslim community. Uh, they are clearly going to think that they are being prejudged, uh, that they're being accused, even in the absence of, of, at that stage, any evidence. To 7-7 ripple effect, Tony Blair's statement is evidence he was part of a conspiracy to blame Muslims for the attacks. Tony Blair said on the day of the explosions that we know this was done in the name of Islam when there was no proof whatsoever of who had done it therefore indicating he possibly had foreknowledge of the plan and who they intended to blame and the reason why they were going to blame the Muslims. We know that these people act in the name of Islam. But was Tony Blair's instant certainty evidence of a huge conspiracy? Or was there another explanation? The government has always rejected calls for an independent inquiry into the bombings. Instead, it promised a full account. We will bring together all the evidence that we, we have and we will publish it so that people, the victims and others, can see exactly what has happened. Nearly a year after the attacks, the government published their official report. The official account of the bombings in London on 7th of July last year. Its narrative was meant to be the definitive account. The four then traveled from Luton to King's Cross, leaving at 7.40 a.m. and arriving at King's Cross at 8.23 a.m. The official account is based on the four bombers catching that train. But months before it was published, this man had already uncovered a fact that would force a revision in the official narrative. Nick Collistrom began his investigation at Luton Station. Six weeks after the event, we found out this remarkable fact, which had not been anticipated by those who planned this crime, that all the trains that morning were severely delayed due to our overhead power troubles in the Mill Hill area. Immediately after the attacks, it was reported that police had established the four bombers had caught the 740 train from Luton to London King's Cross. Nick Collistrom was not convinced. He decided to take a closer look at what time each delayed train had actually left Luton that day. He made an amazing discovery. What did you find? Well, the simple fact was 740 had not run that day, which the whole government case had been predicated upon them getting the 740 train. That is how the perfect crime unraveled. The official report said the four men had taken a train that was actually cancelled. The government now say that the four bombers actually got on an earlier train, but crucially, they arrived in time to carry out the attacks. The Home Secretary had to explain why the official account was wrong. The police have now told us that that is incorrect. The train, in fact, left Luton Station at 7.25 a.m. Now, although this does not appear to affect anything else in the official account, it is nevertheless an error, and that is why I report it to the House. An innocent mistake by the government or evidence of a conspiracy? It wasn't just a train that got wrong. It was a whole fabricated story. Uh, evidence that did not exist, could not have existed. The ghost trains, the 740 was cancelled that day. Nick Collistrom's discovery travelled far and wide on the internet. Cancelled, and we then interviewed people. And the official account had to be revised. By sloppy drafting, unclear sourcing of information. 
Nick Collistrom also questions the authenticity of the CCTV image of the four men entering Luton Station. Suspicions focus on the figure in the white baseball cap and the way the railing appears in front of his face and body, rather than behind him. The fabrication is most evident when you look at the figure of Mohammed Khan and the railing which should be behind him, going in front of him. To Nick Collistrom, these blurry pixels add up to a conspiracy. It was fabricated because the four did not meet up in that car park and did not get the train up to London that morning, in my view. In the aftermath of 9-11, rumours swirled around the globe alleging a Jewish conspiracy. The Israeli secret police were alleged to have tipped off Jewish workers in the Twin Towers. And in London, after 7-7, there were similar allegations of warnings received by Jewish people. 7-7 ripple effect questions whether Israel could have been part of a grand conspiracy. Was the London bombing a covert MI5 operation or an Israeli Mossad operation? There was a credible news report that day that Israeli officials at the embassy in London were warned about the impending attacks. Let me just uh, read this from the Associated Press Newswire. Senior Israeli official says Scotland Yard told Israel minutes before explosions that it had received warnings of possible terror attacks. On 7-7, the Israeli embassy was staging a trade convention for top international financiers at this hotel at Liverpool Street. Among the guests were the Israeli ambassador and Benjamin Netanyahu, then Israeli finance minister. But Mr Netanyahu never arrived. In the confusion after the attacks, Associated Press reported that Scotland Yard had tipped off the Israeli delegation. Is that why Mr. Netanyahu didn't show up at the conference? Amir Gilad was Benjamin Netanyahu's media advisor and was at his side during his time in London. Mr. Netanyahu and his team were staying at this hotel in Mayfair. On the morning of 7-7, they were preparing to drive across London to the conference at Liverpool Street. We were eating breakfast here about 8.30, a quarter to 9 o'clock in the morning. And we were supposed to get out of the hotel around 9 o'clock uh, towards uh, Liverpool Street. Just around the corner from Liverpool Street, the conference was just getting underway. Jerry Lewis is a journalist who was covering the event. There were about 250 people here. Leaders of industry from Israel, leaders of industry from Britain. Uh, some breaking news. Reports are just coming in of an explosion. At 8.50, a bomb ripped through a tube train just after leaving Liverpool Street Station. In Mayfair, Mr Netanyahu was about to leave for the conference. On the way out of the dining hall, I bumped into a British policeman who said, wait, wait, don't go out because something happened in the uh, Liverpool Street area. Uh, we understood that it was an explosion, so we uh, stayed in the hotel. So there was a warning, but only after the attack. This photograph shows Jerry Lewis with the Israeli ambassador two minutes after that bomb went off. None of the important guests knew in advance. It was only an hour after the bomb exploded that the hotel was evacuated. Had they known anything, this conference at 9 o'clock would never have started. They would have cleared everybody out way in advance. They would not, not have allowed the people of the calibre that were here to have remained here. There is no evidence of any warning before the attacks. The Israeli embassy say they weren't tipped off. Associated Press told us their report was based on incorrect information from a senior Israeli source and Scotland Yard say they didn't have any advance knowledge and gave no warning. Like the conspiracy theory suggesting Jewish workers were warned to stay away from the Twin Towers on 9-11, the 7-7 Israeli warning is fiction. I think it's a fairy tale, like other fairy tales that we are used to be uh, involved in during history as Israelis and uh, as Jews. I think it's outrageous even to think that the Israeli security services are involved in this. According to the official account, these men 
got on board three tube trains carrying homemade explosives in rucksacks and blew themselves up, killing 39 innocent people and injuring many more. The next key contention of the conspiracy theory is that the bombs were actually planted underneath the carriages by government agents. Bruce Late is a survivor of the attacks who thought he saw evidence of a bomb underneath the train. On the morning of 7-7, Bruce was on his way to a ballroom dancing audition. At Liverpool Street, he got on a circle line train heading towards Oldgate. I just got on the train, sat down reading the newspaper about us getting the Olympics in 2012, and I've had quite a good feeling about everything. Sitting on the train, going to my uh, audition. Must have been not much longer than 30 seconds. All of a sudden, it didn't feel like I was on the train anymore. Um, something was very, very different. It was very strange. I had had this very heavy feel to it. This very heavy kind of not of this world feel to it. According to the official account, Shehzad Tanweer had detonated a bomb, killing himself and seven others. In the aftermath, something caught Bruce's eye. As I was uh, getting off the train, I noticed that there was a hole, and the hole was uh, as if there was a bomb or an explorer, and the, the explosion had burst up through the floor of the train, and that was just about there. Bruce doesn't know whether he actually saw evidence the bomb was underneath the carriage, and not in Tanway's rucksack, as the authorities said. Across London, at Edgware Road Underground Station, there were other suggestions from survivors of a hole underneath the carriage. At 8.50, a circle line train had been devastated by an explosion just outside the station. Some of those on board were telling a Guardian journalist of how the explosion came from beneath the train. Where we believe there was an explosion this morning under the carriage of a train. Uh, and some passengers described how the tiles, the covers uh, on the floor of the train suddenly flew up, raised up. And... Nearly two and a half years after 7 7, Bruce got a mysterious package in the post. Why do you think you were sent the DVD? To open up a can of worms in my mind. It was a copy of the internet film 7-7 Ripple Effect. I don't really know who it was sent by, but um, there was some foreign sounding name uh, in the credits at the end of this uh, DVD. A message from Moody about the 7th of July 2000. 7-7 Ripple Effect draws on one interview Bruce gave a few days after the attacks, where he mentioned a hole in the carriage floor. It was published in his local paper, but it wasn't missed by Muad Deeb. Pre-planted explosives. Witnesses of the tube train explosions state that the floors of the train blew upwards from underneath, not downwards, as would be the case with explosives inside the train. 7-7 Ripple Effect claims the four men blamed for the bombings were patsies. They were tricked into travelling to London with rucksacks on 7-7. They were caught on CCTV to incriminate them. The video claims the authorities then set off pre-planted explosives on the tubes and bus and framed the four men. That's when I started asking the questions. What did happen? If what the ripple effect says is true, then we should know about it and it should be looked into in, in a massive way because, like I say, it, it basically is saying that somebody is to blame other than those suicide bombers. Who is it? The internet is alive with allegations that on 9-11, three huge skyscrapers were destroyed by controlled demolition and that it was an inside job. Now, similar allegations are being made about 7-7 that it, too, involved controlled demolition by government agents. 
At 9.47 in Tavistock Square, a number 30 bus was torn to pieces by an explosion. According to the official account, Hazib Hussein had detonated a bomb on board, killing himself and 13 other people. But if that's true, why was there a controlled demolition van next to the bus? This is that van. The company Kingstar specializes in controlled demolition. So what was the van really doing next to the blown up bus? On 7-7, its driver was on his way from Kent to a job in Camden Town. His route took him through Tavistock Square. When the explosion happened, the back of the doors got caved in and the, the roof was dented through for whatever reason, I'm not sure, but something hit the top of the roof. To skeptics, the presence of controlled demolition specialists at the scene of a suspicious explosion cannot be a coincidence. Yes, it says controlled demolition on the side of the van. We do do controlled demolition, but in our own way. Not with explosives, with diamond tip bits. A diamond drilling firm wouldn't be able to get a license for you to use explosives. Does your company have any explosives expertise? No, none at all, none at all. But why did the bus have the words outright terror, bold and brilliant on its side? Please think about the sick minds of the people who planned the attacks. In reality, the words were part of an advert for a film called The Descent. The devastated number 30 bus was just one of 890 buses carrying the poster in London that day. None of this explains why this man, Richard Jones, who had explosives experience, got off the bus a few seconds before it exploded. It was deafening. We were all sort of thrown to the ground with a force. And there was screaming all about. All you could see was the 30 on the back of the bus and uh, a huge column of vertical white smoke going up into the air. To 7-7 ripple effect, it's credible Richard might have left the bomb behind when he got off. He says that he and 11 other people got off the bus just before it exploded. Were the 12 of them a team to cover up what Richard Jones was doing as he planted a bomb? The most serious allegation made by conspiracy theorists is that you actually planted the bomb on the bus and left just before it exploded. Pass. I don't, I, I don't have an answer for that because I think it's so um, ridiculous. Anybody who knows me, you know, would not associate me with uh, anything like that. But what about his explosives experience? Yes, I did work in a, an explosives factory. I served my apprenticeship there for five years, from 1960 to 65, um, as an electrician. Yes, I've walked past uh, places where they're making nitroglycerine, cordite, um, black powder, but uh, I'm not a chemist. I don't understand chemistry. How had Richard become the focus of this conspiracy theory? It turns out that he'd mentioned his background in an earlier interview, because it was the third blast he'd narrowly avoided. The first was at that explosives factory. One of my close friends was killed. They've also been in Belfast at your Europa Hotel when they blew out the reception, as I felt this was the third time that I'd been fortunate to escape with my life. There is no darker truth to Richard's presence on the bus that day. When he got on the bus at Euston Square, it was heading to Angel, where he wanted to go. But then it was diverted south towards Tavistock Square, so he decided to get off. He's a lucky man, not a conspirator. I come up here three or four times a year just to relive and retrace my steps, pay my respects to the people on the memorial um, up the road and um, reflect on how lucky I am.
62 innocent people were killed on 77, and 784 were injured. Although the tragic events are still fresh in many people's minds, this hasn't stopped some conspiracy theorists in their aggressive and ugly pursuit of what they think is the truth. Let me guess, this company did not have anything to do with 77, question mark, question mark. Controlled demolitions must mean you know how to detonate explosives, right? You may have re used remote controls whilst driving past a bus at that moment. Strange, huh? I think the conspiracy theorists behind it need something a little bit more in their lives to do. It was a terrible thing that happened. A lot of innocent people were caught up in it. Um, and I think maybe their thoughts should be with those innocent people. Rachel North is a 7-7 survivor who has taken on the conspiracy theorists. The reaction of some has been vicious. If people come on and tell me I'm a lying Zionist bitch, um, that I'm Islamophobic, prejudiced, hateful, deceitful, front for the government, a source of misinformation, publishing my address, say they're gonna pop round. You can certainly say I'm hostile to what they're saying, yeah. This protester's video, posted on the web, shows a group accusing a former Scotland Yard police officer of being part of a government plot to murder innocent people on 7-7. Who helped you choose those three stations? He has also received hate mail from anonymous 7-7 skeptics. How does it feel to be involved in the murder of over 50 people? You bastards were there. Justice is coming for you, rats. Now you must look over your shoulder for your part in the bombings. No mercy. Peter Power is a crisis management consultant who helps companies prepare for emergencies. In 2003, the authorities staged a full-scale exercise at a tube station in the city of London, preparing for a terrorist chemical attack. On 7-7, Mr. Power was running an exercise for a private client, preparing it for a terrorist attack in London. Could his exercise have been used as cover by the real perpetrators of the attacks? When he gave several interviews that day, he certainly gave that impression to some. At half past nine this morning, we were actually running an exercise for over a company of a thousand people in London based on simultaneous bombs going off precisely at the railway stations that happened this morning. Peter Power said his exercise envisaged simultaneous bombings precisely where it happened that morning. But was this coincidence or conspiracy? Just to get this right, you were actually working today on an exercise that envisioned yes. virtually this scenario. Uh, almost precisely. In 7-7 seven, uh, seven seven Ripple Effect, Muad'Dib hangs much of his conspiracy theory on Peter's exercise. Peter Power, dupe or accomplice? Muad'Dib claims the four men blamed for 7-7 were duped into playing the parts of mock terrorists in Peter's exercise. The real culprits then detonated pre-planted explosives. The men were murdered and framed for the attacks. Muad'Dib has calculated the odds there was no conspiracy his own way. The probability of the 7-7-2005 drill and attack coinciding is one chance in 3715592613265750000 For the first time, Peter is demonstrating exactly what he was doing that day. It kicked off by showing a map of London, because our client is based right in the middle. He is rerunning the actual exercise he began on the morning of the attacks. Our uh, scenario involved three bombs. Liverpool Street, King's Cross, uh, here in Russell Square. On 7-7, bombs went off on tube trains in the tunnels very close to two of the stations Peter chose. He says this was coincidence. The London Underground system had already been bombed 18 times since 1885. Uh, so there was a pretty logical place to actually think about having a scenario. This really was what I call a no-brainer in terms of choosing it as, as a scenario for terrorism. In the months before 7-7, a city bank and the Metropolitan Police both ran exercises rehearsing their response to bombings at tube stations. The police exercise took place just six days before 7-7. They weren't doing it because they knew something in advance. It was common sense, not conspiracy. This was a projection of logical 
uh, scenarios based as much on historical evidence as what could happen in the future. Conspiracy theories ignore key facts about Peter's exercise. It was nothing like the 2003 full-scale exercise. Instead, it was entirely office-based. It involved just six people from Reed Elsevier, a publishing company. Absolutely nobody involved, no one beyond the room involved at all, no telephone calls, no cast of Ben-Hur hidden round the corner. It was a gentle walkthrough based on uh, a scenario which tragically turned out to be somewhat more realistic than we realised. We now know much more about the attacks, but that hasn't stopped a significant number of people believing that the government could have been involved. Allegations of a ghost train, rumours of pre-planted explosives, mysterious warnings and talk of controlled demolition have taken root. Back at Birmingham Central Mosque, we were invited to a meeting to discuss the 7-7 attacks. We are not talking about conspiracy, we are talking about an alternative view. Like the 7-7 survivor Bruce Late, Dr. Nassim had also been sent a DVD anonymously in the post. Now he introduced 7-7 ripple effect at the meeting. I don't know how many of you have watched the DVD, The Ripple Effect. Please raise hands who have watched the DVD. We have the DVDs, you can get it from the office. Please watch it. Dr. Nassim made 2,000 copies of 7-7 Ripple Effect for the mosque. A message from Modi. The film's alternative theory of 7-7, in which the four British Muslims were deceived by the authorities and framed for the attacks, lands on fertile ground. Actors or patsies? This video is more compelling than the government version. The government has been lying from A to Z. Government lies about the weapons of mass destruction. Government lies about Saddam Hussein's connection with Al Qaeda. It's more than coincidence. What happened is exactly what it says in there. So you think that the government could have caused July 7th? Yes, yes. I mean, after seeing this, nobody can doubt. My only question is how these people who have made this, I mean, the disc. Where did they get the time and how did they observe the situation that they have been able to produce this? That is my only reservation. Other than that, I think if it, that is, if, they, if, that, if I know their source, of course I have no hesitation to accepting it. If people, independent people, can compile DVDs like this within, you know, a certain amount of time, using very, you know, they don't even have, like, the, what government resources have. How can they come up with this sort of stuff and make it so believable to the public? And why can't the government do the same to make the, uh, to make the public believe that this stuff is true? Why can't they do that in time? Why are we being asked, why, why, why do we trust, trust the government's version? The question to be asked is, why should we trust the government? Massive effect. There is much suspicion about the government here, which helps conspiracy theories find favour. Whether the bombings were done by MI5, the Israeli Mossad, or both of them, and or others, has yet to be determined. But the one thing that we can be sure of is that it was not done by four young Muslims. The ripple effect is more convincing than the government statement. Why do you say that? Because of the key issues it has raised, because the flaws it has pointed to, which agree with the flaw that have already been pointed by other people, too. The sleeper must awaken. The sleeper must awaken. To many, these conspiracy theories are divisive. If people in mosques think that um, the government is so antagonistic towards them that they're actually willing to frame them for a monstrous crime they didn't commit, what does that do to levels of trust? That is a problem for the government and for everybody in this country. And there's concern that conspiracy theories could alienate Muslims from the authorities. It's crucial that uh, the police and the security services uh, win the trust and confidence of the Muslim community. That's where very useful information could potentially come in terms of preventing another atrocity. And therefore, I think it's very important that the government, the police and the security services pay attention 
to these conspiracy theories and do whatever they can to try and disprove them. Second chapter title. Although DV Peter Power. Power is the focus of much of 7-7 Ripple Effect, he had not been sent a DVD then, by its maker. We showed him the film for the first time. On TV by Peter Power. Peter Power, dupe or accomplice? Why did Peter Power smirk, grin and giggle when he spoke about the coincidence that the exercise had turned out to be real when lots of people had been killed and injured? What is funny about that? But Peter has been put in a difficult position. The false allegations against him are coming from an anonymous source. When you look at it closely, it is in fact quite menacing. It is in fact uh, quite worrying. And both the DVD and more important, my, my um, being mentioned in it repeatedly, um, and many, many of the emails that are particularly hateful have now all been passed to the Metropolitan Police. How can you prosecute someone who don't know who they are? It's just not feasible to do that. The makers, they are in fact hiding behind a, a cloak of anonymity. So who is the man behind the film who uses an Arabic sounding name, Muad Deeb? Will he ever emerge from the shadows? Four years on from 7-7, there has been no public inquiry into the bombings. But important evidence of what happened has been released in three official reports. First the Home Office narrative, then two reports by the Intelligence and Security Committee. The committee tackles some of the conspiracy theories, calling them inaccurate allegations. It found no evidence that Peter Power's exercise on 7-7 was anything other than an astonishing coincidence. The committee says the allegation that this CCTV image is fake is unfounded. They say any anomalies in the picture are due to freezing low quality video. The committee also confirmed that MI5 had come across two of the bombers long before the attacks. But it concluded that MI5 did nothing wrong because they were not in a position to know that the two men were about to plant explosives. And a recent court case about 7-7 released significant new evidence showing these four men did carry out the attacks. Soon after, 7-7 investigators had uncovered the bomb factory in a flat in Leeds. And these photographs show the equipment at the scene. The court also saw an A4 pad with the handwriting of Khan, Hussein and Tanweer. It was found in the same flat evidence they planned the attacks at the bomb sites investigators found the explosions were caused by high explosives carried in rucksacks detonated while placed on the floor of the tube carriages and the bus there was no evidence of remote detonation or timers and what about the Guardian report of witnesses saying the explosion came from underneath the tube at Edgware Road the journalist spoke to other witnesses, closer to the blast, who clearly said the explosion came from inside the tube and not underneath. Skeptics who have relied on Tony Blair's statement as evidence there was a government plot to demonize Muslims these people are on weak ground. Act in the name of Islam. They ignored what he went on to say. But we also know that the vast and overwhelming majority of Muslims here and abroad are decent and law-abiding people who abhor this act of terrorism every bit as much as we do. What is extraordinary is that conspiracy theories persist in spite of the fact that both Mohammed Sadiq Khan and Shehzad Tanweer recorded martyrdom videos. Although the London attacks are not mentioned, the call to holy war is plain to see. With this, I leave you to make up your own mind. And I ask you to make the law to allow Almighty to accept the work from me and my brothers and enters, enter us into gardens of paradise. What's more, a year ago, CCTV showing the four bombers' movements on 7-7 was finally released. This footage showed all four men in London that day. Previously, Nick Collistrom, the man who revealed the mistake about train times, had argued the men were never there. 
I've heard people say, really. Mm. But, but aren't they the images that you've been questioning? For yeah, that would seem to be, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, uh... Do you think it proves the government's case? Uh, well, it, it, it might do. I, I can't say that at the moment. No, I certainly couldn't say that at the moment. But there's something you don't know about Nick Collistrom. He claims the deliberate extermination of Jews in the Holocaust is the greatest lie ever told. Two years ago, he published an article on the internet entitled The Auschwitz Gas Chamber Illusion. I don't speak German. I don't go to Germany. I've never had the slightest interest in Nazi philosophy or anything. But I believe what I wrote was absolutely correct. I totally stand by what I said. I'd be happy to present it anywhere. Rachel North helped expose Nick Collistrom's pernicious theory. If his so-called research has led him to these, frankly, ridiculous conclusions about the Holocaust, then it, why on earth would you trust any of his research into 7-7 and 9-11 as well? He obviously is of a mindset where he um, is quite able to willfully ignore scientific or historical or eyewitness or forensic evidence. So I suppose that's, you know, I think it is worth flagging that up to people. The 7-7 ripple effect film is stirring up suspicion about the bombings, sowing dissent across Britain. The film viciously targets a number of innocent people, falsely accusing them of involvement in an official conspiracy to kill British citizens. Why are Peter Power, Richard Jones, Commissioner Ian Blair, the anti-terrorist branch who shot and murdered these innocent people, the Israeli Mossad, Tony Blair, and the government itself not under investigation for these horrendous crimes. This far, the man behind 7-7 ripple effect, Muad Deeb, had evaded scrutiny, but we tracked him down. Ireland. The search for the man behind 7-7 ripple effect has brought us here. From the town of Kells, Muad Deeb has waged a propaganda war to win Britain over to his distorted vision of reality. We can reveal Muad Deeb is John Hill from Sheffield. John Hill, John Hill, BBC Conspiracy Files. Can I ask you why you've made a film accusing innocent people of mass murder on 7-7 with no evidence at all? Can I ask you why you're ignoring the huge weight of evidence against the four men blamed for the 7-7 bombing. You have made a film which is damaging trust in the British government and is undermining community cohesion in Britain. Is that your intention, Mr Hill? Mr Hill, why do you hide behind the name Muad Dib? Taking his name from a science fiction film, Muad Dib, John Hill believes the Ark of the Covenant is buried nearby under the hill of Tara. A document on his website reveals he believes he is the Messiah. 7-7 is just one facet of John Hill's bizarre world view. Since we caught up with him, John Hill has been arrested. He is facing extradition to the UK on a charge of perverting the course of justice by sending DVDs of 7-7 Ripple Effect to the judge and jury foreman in a trial linked to 7-7. For your own sakes, make copies of this film for everyone you know and for the media outlets in your area. Long live the fighters. Mordeep. News of his arrest spread fast around the conspiracy world. Very powerful film. And this has blown up in their face, though. Now everybody's watching 7-7, The Ripple Effect. It's just exploding all over the web. Just amazing. Okay, what's happening to Anthony Hill? Where is this going right now? Last time I heard, they want to extradite him to England for charges. Uh, you know, he's been grabbed in Ireland. The evidence clearly shows these four men carried out the 7-7 attacks. But still, the conspiracy theories mutate and move on. Hello and welcome to BCFM's Friday Drive Time. 
In Bristol, the leading 7-7 skeptic, Tony Gosling, hosts a regular show on community radio. Although 7-7 ripple effect has been discredited, he carries on disseminating it. He's playing an extract on his drive time show, which is broadcast across Bristol. In other words, he was saying that they would write the script for and then edit and control the media coverage of an event in which there were three explosions on London tube trains. The producer of that film, uh, The 7-7 Ripple Effect, which is an intimate film, is, uh, was in jail recently in Ireland awaiting extradition to the UK. Does the fact that uh, John Hill has written about being the messiah undermine what he's saying about 7-7? Well, to a certain extent, of course it does. But he's still making some important points. Despite the fact that he's, uh, uh, he thinks he's Jesus Christ, that's what he says on his website, he does actually raise some important issues as well. So we've got to be careful, I think, with, with Muad Dib not to throw the baby out with the bathwater. The government and the police didn't want to do an interview. The Metropolitan Police said in a statement that it completely rejects any suggestion that it fabricated or tampered with evidence in any way. They said they deal with evidence which must be corroborated, not with conspiracy theories which have no substance and make appalling accusations. I think somebody needs to say, you may have seen some stuff about the bombers were never in London. You might have heard the story about the train that they got never ran. You may have heard people saying the bombs are under the trains. We'd like to show you our side of the story. Have a look at the evidence and see if you think it's reasonable. See, that would have helped. A colleague from Bristol has come with Tony Gosling to spread the conspiracy message. They have come to meet a man who can open new doors for them. Dr. Nassim, the chairman of Birmingham Central Mosque. What we, you see, we've got two parallel strands functioning here. One is people like ourselves who are working on, on the internet, who've made all of these films, and we've got the Muslim community which has its own suspicions and its yeah. own knowledge. We're working on parallel tracks, but what we need to do is have some events where we bring these two things together. Yes. But I would they want to stage a meeting to unite Muslims and non-Muslims around the belief 7-7 could have been an inside job. They're going to play a video promoting conspiracy theories and stir up more suspicion. I will provide the venue. Mm -hmm. I'll do the publicity for it. You choose the day. The well, if we do, if we do it on the on the on the seventh, that's a Tuesday. On the seventh of July, I think is the, it's the best time to do. That meeting is due to go ahead at the Birmingham Central Mosque this weekend. Programs like this may be very controversial, but hopefully there will be people in the police service and in the security service and in government who will realise how important uh, conspiracy theories are and how important it is uh, to try and prevent further atrocities that every attempt is made to try and counteract them. On Newsnight tonight, is the government sabotaging conservative attempts to look at the nation's books? Is it time for an amnesty for illegal immigrants? And have the Iranian protests enabled blogging to supplant journalism? Join us at 10.30.